Hey, nice. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Ignore me. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. um, actually, do I want to do this? Like, no, nah, I'll just. Yeah, this. I'm audible, right? Hey. All right. All right. Uh, our speaker to, uh, for right now, uh, RPM dependency of use. Uh, we have Will Woods, a Red Hatter of 15 years? Uh, almost. This is my 15th year. It'll be nice. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so it's something like that. Give it up for him. <laughs> hey, all. Um. Ah. Hold on one moment. Hey. Eating crackers and sand all day and parched. Uh. Hi, so this is me talking about RPM dependency abuse, and thank you all for coming, and I want to say uh, in advance that um, due to some circumstances outside of my control, I didn't get as far in my research on this. I was hoping to present like working demos of some of the stuff I want to talk about, and I just haven't been able to get around to that. Hopefully, my brave employer will see fit to let me have some time to work on this, um, or, or uh, you know, setting the problem straight or at least firmly crooked. Um, but we'll see. So RPM dependencies, they're fun. Um, uh, well, yeah, by the way, this uh, nothing I'm saying here is actually like Red Hat uh, official. It's kind of just me ranting as a person who has seen way too much inside of RPM and uh, is worried about it. Um, and yeah, I wrote these like two hours ago. Um, so. RPM dependencies are very, very complicated. We keep pushing more and more of the complexity of the system that we, where we build software and put it out to the world into RPM dependencies. So the, the operation of the system, when you look at it as a whole, a lot of it is encoded in a sort of big ball of like a graph of dependencies where all these little things point to each other and they're all connected in ways that nobody understands fully anymore. Um, um, and, you know, the whole thing runs as root, which is super cool. Um, so, so I don't know that there is, there are no, there's no specification for RPM. Um, I mean, there is mention of it in the Linux, uh, what is it, the LDP? Yeah, the LSB, um, but that's a de facto specification. If you implemented the stuff that's in there, it won't work because we changed it. Um, we don't change. Uh, we don't like publish a spec for any of this stuff. We sort of publish documentation about how it's supposed to work, but it's basically the code works. Use that. Um, this is why there's no like third-party um, RPM installer tools because nobody else can get it right. The only canonical implementation or description is the RPM code itself, which seems kind of bad. Because we keep adding more and more features, and we don't really know how they all interact. So, just to go some, just go through the basics of RPM a little bit. Um, dependencies are a pretty good idea, right? You've got a software package of some sort. It provide, it has some capabilities. Um, so yeah, packages should be able to require each other, right? Like this thing uses this library. So if I install this thing, I also need to install this library. Okay, that's sensible. Um, well, and then you get versions involved, and it's like, okay, I can now say, all right, so every package now implicitly provides itself at whatever version it is, and we compare the version, we have, now we have tools, you can compare the versions, you can say, I require something greater than this version. So now we're doing a matching operation, we're saying, all right, look at all of the things that exist, instead of just saying, find one from this big set of things that exist, you're saying, find all the things that match this, and only this part, and then you have to do some other stuff. So we're getting into like, we're sort of building a weird little set theory thing here with, um, with it, which can, starts to get complicated later. Um, so yeah, basic RPM dependencies. You have requires, you have obsoletes, you have conflicts. You, you, know, you want to say, all right, this package replaces this one. They're all sensible ideas, but the way they interact after a while gets yeah, interesting. There's also things like build requires, um, which is to say, so when you say, okay, when, you, when I say this package requires this thing, what do I mean by that? Implicitly, whenever we talk about re requirements, we're saying, uh, in the RPM world, we're saying at, well, 
depending on how you think about it. It's basically, when I want to run the software that is in this package, it won't run cor like, correctly unless this other thing is there, which is sort of a vague notion. We have one other version of that, which is to say, oh, right, that doesn't cover every case, because sometimes we need a package to be installed when I build a thing. So we added one more. But there's like a lot more subtle interactions between packages that we just don't really have tools or really have tags to capture. So we've sort of started doing other things to just sort of fake it rather than actually getting good data. So we're like, so now we have weak dependencies where you can be like, okay, well, this package kind of wants this other package to be there, but it's cool if it's not. Um, or this package wants this thing to be there, and if it's there, that's great. And if you don't feel like installing it, I don't know, that's fine too. Like the the precise definitions of these things are like we do have precise definitions for them, um, but that's the only like tool that we really had for being first saying either this thing requires this or it doesn't. And now it's like now we can say kinda, which doesn't really help with a lot of. Oh, with everything. Oh, and then we're like, well, what if we could do it backwards? Maybe that'll help. So now you have supplements and enhances where you can say, I kind of like this other package to be, or I help out this other package, so maybe you want to install that one too. Um, or you say, oh, uh, or an even weaker version of that. So we've got, we've got the concept of like the strength of a connection between two packages. Um, but no, nothing else about the pack. Oh, and now, so now we say we had one connection between packages, and then we're like, okay, now we have a, like a bold version, an italic version, but it's still a connection between the packages. And now we're like, okay, now we can do backwards connections, where I say, I, that guy over there, he likes me. Okay, cool, <laughs> I guess. And then we got real silly with it, um, where you can start doing things like, okay, I want this package and that package to be installed, or I want that package if it's greater than this version, or this other thing is fine too. Um, or you can say, I, you know, I can do with and without. Like, I want this, I want these two packages. They have to be from the same package or something like that. So we can, you can start putting all of these things together. So at this point, you've got all of these things that I think RPM dependencies are turning complete. <laughs> Um, and this is the theory, right? Like, so imagine you have a package that's called DPU AX, like an like a register on a CPU, right? You got zero, version zero to 255, so you've got like a high byte and a low byte. So then you've got another package that's instruction one, set AX, whatever, and it just says, okay, I require that package. And then you've got another a next instruction, which requires, you know, like I want to increment AX. Okay, so that means if we're at one, go to, or yeah, if it's zero, go to one. If it's, I mean, it would be a really gross thing. <laughs> and each instruction there, there uh, obsoletes the previous one, thus booting it out of the dependency uh, uh, transaction as it's being solved. I'm pretty sure if you put enough of these things together, you could do arbitrary calculations during depth solving inside of RPM. I don't think we meant to do that. I don't think, I don't think that was on purpose. I think this happened by accident. Um, I don't think that's great also because it also runs as root. Because, like, what if I just went around doing things like, like any packager can, can make these sorts of declarations and we have the reverse ones now. So like, oh, so yeah, enhances and suggests we have reverse ones. But you could probably also do things like this. Say that some, some package that's on everybody's system, say that you obsolete it, but you also require it. And I think what'll happen is that it'll see that and it'll be like, okay, well, uh, I'll put you in here because you've, your system has this installed and this new package obsoletes it. Okay, so I need to pull this in. And then, you know, just to make sure that we don't break people's systems, you also pull in the thing that you say that you're replacing. And then I can do whatever I want. So, like, I could probably just write a package that, you know, injects itself into your next update transaction and then run whatever scripts I want. Um, and, like, okay, but you're, you're going to notice if, like, there's this weird package that gets installed in your system and then, you know, the post script says rm dash rf slash or whatever. Um, but like, what if I start hiding what's in the scripts? What if I'm doing, what if I hid things in like the change log? And so I can, of some other package, and I can just like pull parts of the other package change log out and execute them so that like I, the scripts that I'm running on your system is actually being pulled from places that aren't in my package. It would be really hard to trace back where the code that got executed even came from. So like, at a certain point, I'm pretty sure that I could 
craft a package that would inject itself onto every Fedora system in the world, figure out, you know, figure out what users are on it. Like, I could figure out if it's Adam in the, uh, in the room. Well, I was going to pick on Adam Williams, but, uh, oh, there you are. Hey, Adam. So, yeah, what I was, what I was going to do for this talk, uh, what I was hoping to do um, was... I was gonna find. I was gonna do try all of this out, and I was gonna get a package injected on every system with some innocuous name that you wouldn't even notice was getting installed during an update, and um, I was going to have it wait until today. And oh, it was also gonna check to see what users were on the system and look for your username. <laughs> and it was gonna wait until this. And it was gonna wait until this time of day. <laughs> And then I was going to pop up a whole bunch of hot dogs on your screen just during the talk, just to sort of, just to sort of prove the point. It's yeah, it's left as an exercise to the reader whether or not I can actually make hot dogs pop up on your screen. Uh, but it was, the pieces are all there as far as we can tell. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are. And there, yeah, there are people watching, and you do want to watch out for that. But I think that um, because uh, scriptlets can be super duper complicated. Um, I mean, you can write them in Lua, and not everybody knows Lua. And if you're, you know, clever or determined, you can make it so that your script looks innocuous. And you could probably sneak through a code review. You can also have packages like remove themselves or have a pair of package, one that shows up later and removes your other package. So there's no trace that the thing that got installed or that did the damage to your system isn't there anymore. Or, you know, you'll have some record that it was there. But we don't keep a historical record of every package that has ever been installed on your system. It's in the yum log, I think. But we're not sure about that. Um, so, oops. There's an RPM log. There, wait, there is the there is an RPM log. Transaction log. It does. Okay, good. Um, oh, there was. We don't use it, but it's there. We don't use. There's a lot of that in RPM. Yeah, there's there's a larger theme here. There's that you know I wanted to talk about the, this part because it kind of scares me. And there's a lot in RPM that we don't fully understand or really use anymore. Did you know RPM has per file dependencies? Yeah, we don't use them, but they're there for every single file and every single package. There's 15 million files in uh, Fedora 27. And um, yeah, we have um, the output of the file command and the, um, uh, yes, output of the file command and a, a relationship between, you know, which dependency attaches to which file. And we don't use any of it. Um, we also have great things in uh, RPM headers like um, the file device number. Like when you have a file on disk, it has a device number. When you have a file in a tarball, it doesn't because that doesn't make any sense unless you're actually backing up from a tarball. So they're still in the RPM headers. They're always zero. It's a 32-bit number that, that's, so there's 15 million 32-bit zeros um, in every package. That's great. Um, there's like 90%, or not 90%, but some huge percentage of the metadata that's in package headers is totally unused or nonsensical at this point. Um, like the package icons. Oh, yeah, pa package icons and things like that are really, are, are great. Um, well, no, there's, I mean, there's headers that we don't use, like, yeah, like icons, but there's headers that are in RPM that we just ignore, like, yeah, file device, uh, file inode number. There's an inode number stored for every file in every RPM. Um, yeah, right. We wanted, yeah, apparently we wanted to have complete CPIO headers for every file, so we did that. Um, there's another bunch of stuff, like, uh, we, oh, um, RPM only knows about uh, eight types of data. It knows null. Uh, eight bit integer, 16 bit, 32 bit. Uh, it used to know about 64, but we stopped using it. Um, uh, it knows about strings. It knows about arrays of strings, and that's it. Um, oh, it boolean blobs. That's the other thing that it knows about. One thing you'll notice is it doesn't know about arrays of boolean uh, of um, of sorry binary blobs. It doesn't know about arrays of binary blobs, and that's why we store all of the hashes as strings, as hex strings, um, which means that they're all twice as much size as, or twice as big as they need to be, just because we don't have a type for that. Because our, we're like, eh, it's just easier. You put it as a string. And like, okay, these are all little nitpicky things, but when you add them all up, there's a huge amount of slack and unused stuff in RPM. Some of it's just useless, some of it just slows things down, and some of it is, frankly, dangerous. Um, and so I want us, oh, shoot. 
to start thinking about, well, for requires, I wanted to start thinking about um, sort of as a, you know, community and industry, um, thinking about fixing some of this stuff, frankly, um, and what comes after RPM, because like, I'm pretty convinced that a lot of this is really super unsafe and it could be better. To start with dependencies, I think that we'd be really a lot better off if we were talking about required having a purpose for our requires. Like we need a, the, the larger point I'm trying to make is that um, I think we need to actually sit down and design something, <laughs> which is like weird and scary where we've just had this thing we've been using for 20 something years and kind of tacking on more pieces until it accidentally became Turing complete and sentient and maybe can destroy all of your computers, but it hasn't yet, so we're cool with it. Um, we probably should design something that does all the stuff we want it to do and doesn't blow up. Um, so the point for this particular part is talking about um, dependencies, and I think the one thing that we're missing and one reason that we keep pushing more complexity into, like the way we do language packs now is through the soft requirements. They're, they are uh, either enhances or whatever, but like the correct operation and construction of the system keeps getting pushed into this thing that we don't understand and it's actually turned complete and it keeps blowing up. Um, so here we go. Uh, I'm thinking we should have a purpose for requires. Requires should have three bits. I mean, probably strength in here too, but I'm not convinced that like a require strength is actually what we want. I think what we actually want when we're trying to say, well, this maybe wants this other thing, is we're trying to expect some other type of relationship between the two packages. And we need to be able to add those. Well, on, on the previous slide, I talked about test requires. We don't have that. We've been fighting about it for 15 years, and we still haven't added a test requires header, so nobody adds tests to their packages. So the fact that we can't extend RPM to add new things easily easily is holding us back in ways that are becoming dangerous. Um, so um, I don't think we, I don't know about strength. I, I'm willing to have the conversation about whether having the strength for a, you know, requires enhances to suggest is a good idea. But I think that the purpose is one that we're missing. Um, when you say that this package needs another thing, you want to be able to say why it needs that thing. Um, because like, um, if you require them, if you have a man page and you require the man page reader, do you like, does your program actually need man to work? Or is it the man page needs that to work? So there's different relationships happening there other than just requires. So we want it, so at, these should be at the file level, I think, probably, or at least a sub package level. Um, but we also need to be able to talk about different purposes and add new purposes. Um, and then component expression is a thing I've put there. Um, when we talk about thing, when we have like, you know, on the right side, when you say requires, you can say a thing. And it used to be just like a version number, and then it got real, and then, and now you can do all these. And you can, oh, you can nest the hell out of these, and you can do all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, so what we're doing there is sort of, well, you're doing a bunch of stuff there, and it, it kind of hurts my brain. But really, what we want in the simpler model, where it's like, what I'm trying to say is, you know, for this reason, I want some set of, one of some set of things. So you need to be able to describe a set of packages somehow. And that's, you just need some sort of expression for doing that. And right now, the only thing we have is a name. And that's where the names of packages keep getting weirder because, and longer, uh, because the only thing we can do to look up a package is its name. So that's the only thing that we can change to make two packages different. Uh, so we keep cramming more and more things into the name, which is why we have like lib sub packages and you know, all of the other things. That's, that you're talking about the purpose of the package. You're talking about what those parts of the package are for, but like that doesn't need to be the name of the package. So we need some sort of, we need to start designing, yeah, different required types and purposes so that we could just have, okay, this requires at runtime or this requires for testing. Um, and we should have, we should put together, you know, we should think more about packages and um, how you match pieces of packages against each other. When you think about sub-packages, they're kind of tags, really. What you're saying is these files I'm tagging as libraries or man pages or whatever they are. We could have tags. We could do that. That would be pretty cool because then you could have packages that were in, you know, had multiple tags applied because right now a, pack, uh, a file can only be in one package. So you can't, like, have multiple tags on a package. We could fix that. Um, and we could have some sort of language. So you have some way of describing the data that you're providing about your stuff, and then you need some other way of matching against that data to get the pieces that you need to build whatever it is that you're building. These are not like, like, 
cutting edge computer science craziness ideas. This is like really simple stuff. It's just that nobody's bothered to sit down and design a thing for doing it um, in RPM or you know whatever the next thing's going to be. So I think that's what we should do. Let's write some damn specs and figure out like what it is we're actually trying to do here and write code that does it and does it well. Um, so yeah, that's my pitch. Um, so are there any questions? about anything at all, or do you just want to hear me yell about RPM metadata more, because oh my god, I hate it so much. <laughs> so on projects like X2Go and Tiger VNC, we provide an X server. We have the common problem of like, you know, packages explicitly requiring X org when they don't need X org specifically, they need an X, an X server in general. How do you think that should be solved? Yeah, um, so yeah, in RPM land we have virtual provides, which are like a, a hack that we added where you can say a package just provides something and it can be some abstract concept like love and then <laughs> <laughs> it's whatever it's a free form string but you can say yeah my package provides love and then anything that needs and then if there's like 15 packages that provide love then you or then your package can say I need love because everybody yeah. and you'll get one of those packages and the question is which one do you get and like we don't have a way of expressing that that sort of preference. And what used to happen in at least early versions of Yum is, you know, there's like a, a built-in heuristic. Which does anybody in the room know the exact way this happens? I bet Neil does. <laughs> <laughs> it's stat order. What? Yes. It used to be the shortest. Well, there's a bunch of things. The, the so it used to be shortest form order. It used to then ch it changed to minimum dependency tree length. And now it's just LS stat order. Yeah, and there's no spec for this, y'all. And it changes all the time. <laughs> guys just decided to change. They're just like, yeah, yeah you have had this really complex heuristic for how to do it. The DNF was like, no, that's stupid. We're just yeah, let's have a really, uh, let's, let's have a totally different really stupid heuristic for this. And let's not tell anybody or increment any sort of version number yeah. or have any sort of specification. Here's experimentation to figure this out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was a fun time. It's, so yeah, we should, so, uh, the, the idea of virtual provides isn't a bad one it, on its own to, for a package to be able to say, I, you know, I provide this thing. But we need a richer way of matching against those things to, to be able to express the sorts of preferences that we want. Um, and you know, the stuff we have just isn't cutting it. Um, but yeah, virtual provides and virtual, uh, or yeah, virtual provides or capabilities, things like that would be a good idea. We should probably also like have uh, types for that stuff because you know it's just freeform strings in RPM land, and it would be nice if you could say you know I need this amount of love. <laughs> I think actually, I think a distro default should be good. This is just distro default services to enable or disable. You could have distro default X server is X org and default love provider is well I'll leave that ambiguous. Right. <laughs> no, I don't know if you want a default love provider. But uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean at a certain point you need some way for the system to arbitrate like, okay, of the packages that match the you know, this of the set of things that could match, which one should I pick? And the way that you, like that policy will change depending on what you're talking about. Um, and it's, without better metadata, we can't make those sorts of decisions. And that's why you randomly got like XM as your mail transfer agent for a while because it had the short. It was a shorter name than uh, Postfix. So like that's not like nobody knew what it was, and it's not user configurable and. It's just strange. Um, so yeah, a user, there should be defaults for that sort of thing too. Anyway, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, that, like the distro defaults is a big deal for services. It makes sense here. So thank you. Yeah. Stealing default love provided to use is a bad name. <laughs> 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 so uh, this is more of like a question of absurdity here. What happens? Have you ever tried putting emoji into into these strings? Extended Unicode, basically. In, what happens? Into package names? Yes. Um, I think we specifically disallowed that at some point, um, but I'm not certain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the fun part is that like version numbers don't have to be numeric. Um, they can like be anything, as long as they sort, they can do whatever. But they're yeah, it's all it's all just you strings. You can come in in something that can parse and compare RPM version numbers. Uh, yeah, no, it's. Oh yeah, did you did you find out about the the tilde the special behavior with tilde? Yeah, that's fun. So, so the, it, it no longer does this. The new version of Shepard did this for a long time. Shepard had a massive, massive Ruby library to do this. Yeah. Uh, and now it shelled out to a small Python helper that uses uh, Hamlet, 
Yeah. Uh, and because there's no specification for any of this, like everybody has to write their own and everybody gets a few quirks wrong and there's nothing that says Yeah. Right. And so now we have the the Yes. So now we have the well, chicken and egg it's problem. Actually, where it's a function now. Yeah. This is my other. This is sort of the the other part of my pitch is that like we're in this unfortunate circumstance where everything needs RPM to work correctly, but we want to fix RPM, but we can't fix RPM because everything is using it, and without it, it won't work correctly, so we can't change anything. So like we're going to have to build something else um, alongside it. We can't. I don't think we can start by just fixing RPM. I mean, with some of these things we can add to RPM, but I think that it probably behooves us to try to design a, a second thing and then mash the two together, or you know, get from here to there. But um, I don't know that we can apply these sorts of fixes directly to RPM. I do know that writing some specs and like actually having a model for how it should work is a really good first step. Um, oh, that's my opinion, anyway. Feel free to tell me I'm wrong. Um, Sorry. It seems in, in the description you gave, the most dangerous thing is really the first part. But then, how would you uh, have anything that would be nearly powerful enough to give you a way to, to do the stuff you need uh, post install and not have the ability to execute scripts anyway? Um, what do you need to do after install? Because this is, this is a different talk that I gave, but um, you're, so you're asking what would happen without post? Or like, how do you? Or so yeah, that that might be an option. Is just dropping post entirely. What I'm saying is, in the things you exposed, I'm not too concerned about the Turing complete right. thing because of performance concern. Right. I think you know, building a complete machine there might be slow. Yeah, it's no, it, it's more of a parlor trick than it is an actual useful. Right. Yeah. So, uh, but 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 about executing stuff and you know doing that silently, that might be dangerous. But then, are you going to conclude that we get rid of any way to execute scripts in RPM? Is that uh, where you go? No. Well, yes. <laughs> Short answer, yeah, no. Uh, scriptlets have to die. Longer answer is that um, if you go through and look at all of it, uh, the, all the things that happen in scriptlets, um, they're... Uh, well, some of them are optional, but we don't know which ones are optional. Some of them are just like uh, this is a you know this is a performance enhancement enhancement, but we don't know that that you know we don't know the difference whether a postscript is this won't run unless I run this script or if it's like this builds a cache that'll make it start up faster the first time, but you can skip it if you want. Um, so. There's two things I think that need to happen. One is uh, we should totally get rid of scriptlets and instead just have a carefully selected set of things um, that. Uh, we know to be deterministic, like we know what you're going to do. You know, it's not it's not a problem if you're like, I want to create a file. Sure, uh, I want to write some data to a file. Okay, I know that what that's going to do, and I can decide when to do that I, as the the system can be smarter about that. Um, and we can make allowances for things where, like, for anything that actually needs some code to be run after the package is installed. There might be an argument for that, but I uh, so I went through and read every scriptlet in uh, in RHEL seven, like every scriptlet in every package in RHEL, and it only does, there's only like six things that are happening, and it's mostly like adding users, starting services, um, building caches, um, and sometimes it's like making keys and things like that. Um, so like we don't need we don't need to let users or packagers run arbitrary scripts. That's dangerous, frankly kind of silly. Um, we can hand them the tools that they need um, and let them use those tools, and especially if we design them to be safe, especially if we design them so that they, you know, we know when they're going to operate and so that we can uh, be make smart decisions about like when to do the things. Um, did that answer the question? It does, and uh, what about having a rule where you can execute, you know, you add some stuff that allows you to execute a comment, but all the comments have a, a common prefix, like for git. Sorry? All the comments have a common prefix that is added automatically, like for git. So uh, you'd have RPM dash something, and you can only execute RPM dash something functions. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, we could totally work this in. Um, actually, my uh, if we're working on it, or working on it in the current stuff, we're trying to add um, basically macros um, for all of the common tasks, so that po and eventually I would like to see it so that um, it, out in the packaging world as it exists now, um, it will have a rule that says, okay, after a certain point, your script like can only use these macros, and anything else will be rejected.
Mm-hmm. All right. Anything else? Um, all right. Great. Let's thank our speaker. Yes. Oh. Thank you all very, very much. Oh, uh, uh, so uh, what's going to happen is uh, at 6 o'clock, we all have to be out of here and in the lobby. And then once the party starts at 7, you guys can come back in. So we have some games going on in the lobby, so uh, you, we can tide you guys over. Lobby, you mean like downstairs? Yeah, downstairs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think we're good for now, but like at 6 o'clock, uh, I was told that everyone has to be in the lobby. So... Yeah. 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 Yeah.